So hi everyone and welcome to this video on price discrimination which is the start of the second leg of our module on monopolies. So in the past few videos we've been discussing on how a monopoly sort of behaves compared to a perfectly competitive market and what are the general characteristics of a monopolist. Now we're gonna uh, try and explain a practice that some monopolists tend to do which is to perform price discrimination, which is some interesting and key concept in microeconomic theory and the theory of competition. So um, essentially, when we say price discrimination, it's, it's mainly two different things, right? So it's charging different consumers different prices for the same product. So that's one form of potential discrimination. And another is charging the same consumer different prices for different quantities of the same product. So all of these forms of uh, this price discrimination are to extract maximum profit. And they do that by getting it from the consumer surplus and trying to minimize the deadweight loss that we discussed in the last few videos. And essentially... Okay, firms with market power, like monopolists, will often use the information that they know because they have a lot of information about, in, about the individual consumer's demand curves to be able to try and increase their profits. And what they do is instead of setting just a uniform price or obeying the law of one price like in perfect competition, they can perform something called non-uniform pricing. Okay, so... How can a monopolist okay, uh, earn a higher profit okay, when it engages in price discrimination? Well, uh, a monopolist that uses non-uniform pricing can capture some or all of the consumer surplus and the deadweight loss that results if the monopoly sets a single price. So we recalled in the last videos that we did was that the monopoly... Okay, the consumer surplus of a monopoly is less than the consumer surplus of a perfectly competitive market. And in a monopoly, there exists some deadweight loss. Now, what we can do now is because of those facets, okay, and the monopolist's goal is to be able to maximize its profit, okay, it can engage in a non-uniform pricing scheme or price discrimination to be able to sort of reap that extra consumer surplus that it can or to minimize the deadweight loss that's there. And what's happening is a monopolist that sets a high single price, like the case we had before, only sells to consumers who value the good the most, right? Because we know that the price is high in a monopoly, the quantity is low, so only the consumers who value it the most will pay and swallow the higher price. But... Uh, in uh, in that case, those consumers okay, that the monopolists were able to sell to using that single price, they were able to retain some consumer surplus because, in effect, some of them were even willing to pay more than what the monopolists actually charge. And in that case, the monopolist loses sales to the other customers who value the good less than the single price. So there are also consumers who want the good but can pay for the good. And essentially, those lost sales are part of the deadweight loss. So we can see a consumer surplus loss and a deadweight loss sort of loss from it. And by using non-uniform pricing, okay, the monopolist can capture additional consumer surplus and it does this by raising the price to consumers who value the good the most. So those who can afford the good, they can opt to pay more or they, they will be made to pay more in this case. And it can lower its price to consumers who may not be able to afford uh, that said single price before. And the monopoly can make additional sales, which can thereby change into profit and would otherwise have been deadweight loss had it not been tampered with. So... That's the rationale for why, uh, of what per, uh, price discrimination would be. So in the course that uh, we're going to be handling is we're going to tackle three main types of uh, price discrimination. So the, the first uh, type is called first degree price discrimination or what we often refer to as perfect, okay, perfect price discrimination. 
So that's perfect price discrimination. And uh, it's essentially charging each individual a, a, a different price for each unit of a given product. And it's the most profitable of the three. So essentially, if you know the maximum willingness to pay of each of your consumers, then you charge them exactly that. So they have no consumer surplus. You can reap all of that. And that is if the monopolist knows that and if it's allowed by law to do that. The second one is called second degree price discrimination. And essentially what happens is the monopolist will try to attempt maximizing profit by sort of packaging its products rather than selling each product a unit at a time. So it's going to do it in sort of bundles. And the last form of price discrimination is that uh, we call it third degree price discrimination. And it occurs when uh, the monopolist charges different consumer groups different prices for the same product. So maybe uh, it charges the business sector more than, say, uh, the other sectors of the economy. So it could up to sort of discriminate based on industry, based on type, or based on classification. So those are generally the forms of our price discrimination. Now, you may ask, how does a monopolist sort of achieve that? Or what are the things the monopolist must have in order to engage in price discrimination? Apart from it being legal, of course, because, of course, not all forms of price discrimination are, strictly speaking, legal. Okay, so... Uh, there are a couple of requirements. The first is that the monopolist must have the ability to prevent or limit resale. So that's important because, for example, it engages in first-degree price discrimination and it, um, it charges a different rate based on the maximum willingness to pay of each consumer. Well, uh, consumers who buy it for cheap, okay, say the, those who bought things for a low price, have the incentive to be able to sell okay, that good that they obtained from the monopolist at a low price to those, uh, to those consumers paying the monopolist a high price. And they could act as a sort of middleman and reap the profit from that. So a monopolist would need to limit that feasibility of any form of resale. Okay? And uh, that's suboptimal in that case. And two is the ability to identify how consumers differ in their price sensitivities or their price elasticities. So it tends, uh, the monopolist must know which part of its market is elastic in their demand for its good or service and which part of the market is inelastic for their good or service. So a few examples of these are personal services. So say you have a personal makeup artist or a personal barber. Uh, so if you want their services, they're just one, uh, they're just one barber or one servicer. You may have a certain preference for that. And what you do is they can opt to charge different rates for different people, depending on how he or she would perceive their income and, uh, charge that rate, depending on the conditions that are present and so on. So it's not necessarily transferable because you only have one uh, barber. Well, you could off the shift to another barber, but it's probably not the exact same product or service. Another one which is more common and more practical is a utility company, which are often monopolies, as you know. And these utility companies, well, they require physical connections between facilities of producers and consumers. So if consumers, say, wanted to resale electricity to other consumers, well, it's kind of futile because you would need to have some form of infrastructure to connect your two households, which probably doesn't exist because the people who are controlling those infrastructures would be the public utility companies themselves, which are the monopolists themselves. So it's very hard to resale a product such as electricity or say water supply to other consumers and so on. So uh, that's a brief introduction of uh, our concept of price discrimination. And in the next few videos, we will sort of go into each form of price discrimination quite in depth and do problems on them for you to see how each of those differ and what the society sort of gets from it. So thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.